Hello, everybody. Welcome. I'm Shuyan Chen of the Young Mathematical Science Center. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to this evening's mathematics program. We have scheduled a very special event for you. Uh, we have invited a world leading mathematician to deliver the talk, Professor Maxim Konsevich from IHS. Professor Tom Savage has made many outstanding contributions in many fields of mathematics, such as uh, a geometry, uh, topology, uh, inventive geometry, mathematical physics, nearest industry, and so on. So, naturally, he received many outstanding prizes and honors. Uh, it's too long on this. Uh, I just take a subset. Okay, uh, it's a Otto Hahn medal from the map. Uh, and then the prize of prize the Marquis de Paris is uh, for the first European Congress of Mathematics in 1992. And he received the Henry Poincaré Prize in 1997. He received the prize of the International Congress of the Mathematical Physics in 1997. It's, it's the same prize. It, it's just the same prize. Same prize? Yeah, yeah, it, it's, it's just. <laughs> No, no. 
No, 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 no. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. 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 As you said in Hong Kong, and it was in Taiwan, and then it was in Sanya, Sanya. but this was all on the south. And then first time now, and I'm very glad to see all of you. Yeah, so I will talk about some uh, invite you kind of to very strange journey, which started more than thirty five years ago, when I was a young student in Moscow, and finished maybe one month ago. Yeah, and it's it, it's absolutely very very strange. It relates so different subject. I'm still puzzled. Yeah. So, so, what is what is all what is all about? Oops. Okay. Yeah. Suppose we have a function, function, let's say, on one variable called t, and maybe defined in neighborhood of some point, uh, some germ of analytic function. Uh, what we can say. Uh, where we can have a nice formula for this function. There are two well-known possibilities. First, this function could be algebraic function. Uh, so it satisfies uh, algebraic equation of certain uh, uh, degree, degree n, uh, uh, and coefficients of the equations are rational functions of parameter. So consider family of equations depending on parameter and consider solutions of this family of equations. It's called algebraic functions. Yeah, like, I don't know, square root of x, square root of t, yeah, or oh, solution of some more complicated equation. So the graph of function will be uh, algebraic curve. Or it could be some uh, more interesting functions called colonomic functions. It satisfies something very similar. Uh, instead of some of uh, powers of the function multiplied by rational things, you can see the sum of derivatives of the function multiply again by uh, some rational expressions. So f uh, index m, it's m's derivative. And again, coefficients are rational functions. And many uh, usual functions, I don't know, like logarithm, exponent, sine, cosine, are uh, 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 holonomic functions. There are, so there are many more uh, uh, holonomic functions and algebraic functions. Uh, so of course, not every like uh, function sine of x, so to say equations, you know, these coefficients are constant. This f double prime plus f is equal to zero, as everybody knows. Uh, but it's not algebraic function. Uh, yeah, so definitely they're not algebraic functions, uh, which, which are holonomic. But every algebraic function is holonomic. Uh, you can leave your, it's make it maybe, uh, can make many statements. You can see it's a very simple exercise to prove that any algebraic function satisfies uh, some uh, differential equations, rational coefficients. Yeah, I just make just this morning little exercise to take ad hoc functions t plus square root of t, definitely I'll break. Uh, and, uh, and then you, you, you consider that it's, it's first derivative, second derivative, try to, and function itself, try to make linear combination. So this all square root disappears and you found this equation. Okay, so there are mm, holonomic functions in all the small subsets of algebraic functions. And uh, Gertrude Dick, uh, oh, sorry, this one mis misprint here, uh, ask, uh, make his following conjecture. He proposed a criterion. Uh, when you have, suppose you have some differential equation of, uh, uh, of this form, this rational coefficients, when uh, can you check uh, that all solutions are algebraic functions? Of course, it's, if you have algebraic equation, it's, you have uh, like k independent solutions. If each of them algebraic, then all linear combinations algebraic. 
but you don't know a priori degree of this equation, so it's, mm, mm, it's not clear. And he proposed the answer in the case when coefficients of these equations are function, rational functions, not, not with complex coefficients, but with algebraic coefficients. So it will have some arithmetic uh, nature. Okay, what, what, and what is this conjecture? Yeah, first of all, uh, one can uh, when have the system of equations of higher order, uh, of order k, one can go to f, f prime, f double prime, so you can see the column vector, and we reduce to uh, system of equations of first order. And uh, also, I just keep a little, little step. Uh, I said that coefficients are algebraic numbers, so you can go some Galois conjugates, make many, many more copies. One can reduce to system of equations when this a i j are rational functions with rational coefficients. Yeah, yeah. So you can write the system of equations of uh, uh, of on many many functions equivalent to original one, and then what what goes on if you uh, for each sufficient large prime one can uh, make these things with coefficients not in rational numbers but in in a finite field, residues modular prime. Yeah, I just maybe you can try to make some little experiment. You want to ask, for example, you have, for example, get, get some novel something like one third, yeah? And what is modulo five? Yeah, modulo five, it's two modulo five, yeah. So because three times two is equal to one mod five, yeah? Yeah, so one can divide by uh, uh, make inversion. Uh, model a very large prime so it's, so it's uh, completely well defined and th then what you get uh, when you consider things model a pair model a prime number uh, you get a square matrix these coefficients are rational functions with coefficients in this residues model model p and then you look on this equation what's like like derivative with respect to t of column vector plus matrix uh, uh, depending on parameter, you raise the things to piece power. It will be some operator acting on column vectors. And uh, this operator, actually, it's very interesting. You get this operator uh, acting on finite dimensional vector space or, or uh, uh, wide vector space. You see that you get rational functions in one variable with coefficients in the field. It's again the field. Yeah, so you get n-dimensional vector field, space of the field, and it's not obvious from the beginning this operator is linear operator over this field because when you take derivative, it seems to kind of have some Leibniz rule. It's not linear operator, but there is a really beautiful things here. If you consider some p is a prime number, and consider rational function or put just polynomial, and consider let's say polynomial, consider some function f and take p derivative of this p times of this f, of this function uh, there is a, a remarkable thing you get zero uh, model p this p, uh, if you take derivative p time you get zero so if you remove this a p you get zero operator which is uh, uh, not totally obvious and how you how you do it you you calculate derivative of one. P derivative of one is zero, yeah? P derivative of, of t is also zero. P's derivative of t to power p minus one is also zero because it's uh, decreased degree each time, so it'll be zero. But now take P's derivative of t to power p. You get p factorial, yeah? But p factorial mod p is zero. And also the same, t plus p plus one is also get zero. And also, if you take a ratio of two things by applying rules, you get this piece, you apply derivative p time, you get zero in characteristic p. So it's, and here, uh, you get uh, this more complicated things with uh, derivative plus matrix. And, uh, and then it will be linear of this. Things you get some matrix of uh, rational functions. It's called p curvature matrix. Yeah, it's something one can really do it on computer because on computer it has mod, mod p, it's very easy. And uh, then uh, there was a, a very simple observation, in fact, is that if uh, I have such equations that all solutions are algebraic, then the speed curvature is zero. 
uh, it's uh, for, large, for large prime numbers. And uh, it's kind of very um, common thinking uh, uh, in mathematics. If you see that one thing implies another, and both are very complicated, maybe they're equivalent. Yeah, so Grot and Dick uh, are, are conjectured the inverse is true. If all the speaker which vanish for large prime numbers, maybe it's the only reasons would be that it's solution solved break. Yeah, it's also kind of pretty, uh, in a sense, it's not deep conjecture. It's kind of like two complicated things, one in place another, why, why not to be equivalent? Yeah, so now I'll do, uh, this page will be a little bit uh, technical, but uh, just for specialists, but you can ignore it if you don't understand it. Yeah, uh, so uh, the whole thing is formulated not uh, formulated in not such naive terms like we have equation, matrix, and so on. It was more abstractly. You get uh, instead of a system equation of the first order, you consider what's called algebraic flat connection on algebraic vector bundle on algebraic variety defined over. Algebraic number fields, everything is algebraic, yeah. Yeah, so one can formulate it very, very abstractly. Uh, there's also this P curvature business and so on. You just introduce local coordinates and do calculation yeah, as I uh, showed to you, but one can do it abstract stuff. And then um, it was maybe the late 60s, and, uh, and Nick Katz, who was a very young algebraic geometer, he learned this conjecture from Grotendieck, maybe around 70, 69. And, and then he proved uh, some, uh, started to work on it, and he proved some uh, encouraging result. So uh, uh, he proved some things that if the speaker which vanish for large prime numbers, then conjecture, uh, this connection has only regular singularities. Was it, what does it mean in plain terms that uh, solution equation do not grow like exponent? It, it will be grow only like has some power. And also, so this connection can speak about some kind of like monodromia. If you go around a singular point, how solution uh, changes. And he proves that monodromia around any device that's infinity is fine. So it's really good sign that this is algebraic function. But it's definitely not the proof. And nobody proved this conjecture. It's very, very difficult. But, uh, but then Nick Katz proved this conjecture in some special case when these equations come from algebraic geometry. And it's called gauss mannion connection. Yeah. Uh, and I'll just for specialists uh, give, uh, give a sketch of the proof. He has a whole paper about maybe 150 pages, but the idea is very, very simple of this paper. Uh, so uh, there's so, so this peak curvature, and then if you do this connection of algebraic geometry, chemical algebraic geometry, there's something called Hodge filtration. There are some subspaces depending on, or, or on parameters which is not preserved by connection. And, uh, and when I look on this P curvature and how to its behave with respect to this filtration, you get some associate gradient, and then you get, uh, sorry for uh, high tech, it's Frobenius twist of Kadair Spencer operator, and then vanishing in place, vanishing of these operators, and then you use, start to use Hodge theory, which appeared exactly at that time uh, by Deligne uh, about polarizations and, <laughs> Then it gets this positive remission form, chemical polarization, however, constant. And then you see that monodromia is both integral because uh, you have integral homology and unitary, then it should be finite. Yeah, so it was some kind of very, very beautiful uh, arg argument, but uh, very technical. But it's um, it, it, at least in many cases, when you have equations coming from uh, kind of natural uh, equations of geometry, you can prove this conjecture. Yeah, that was the strongest result for many, many years. Yeah, uh, you see that uh, I explained to you what is the speaker, which is some kind of complicated things. You can calculate it on computer, raise the super things to P's power of mod P. Uh, one can uh, say something a, a little bit weaker conjecture, so it should be easier to prove, but in real life, it's kind of equivalent criterion. Uh, uh, again, I say something technical and then explain in plain words what, what does it mean. Suppose we have this uh, flat connection or this holonomic system of linear differential equations, something like this, and over right over number field to get a point, you get some point and you get some local coordinate or, or, or this thing. And uh, you consider basis, consider some basis of the space of formal solutions. Also trivialize your bundle as you like algebraically. And you get some uh, few series and maybe infinitely few variables. 
and look on the denominators of the series. In, if the denominators you have see only finitely many prime numbers, then the thing should be algebraic. And it really does depend on choice where you start to expand, uh, how do you make this local coordinates. It's, one can easily prove that it's uh, uh, something which mm, universal. And uh, what does it mean? Actually, if you do a computer, you solve your differential equation, at some point it's spent in series. And if, if coefficients are integers of all, of all fundamental system of solutions, then these guys should be algebraic. That's really practical criterion to uh, check it without looking on this picker, which is uh, stuff. Yeah, so there is this uh, relation. Algebraicity implies this integrality of solutions, uh, integrality of coefficients of solutions. It implies when you have picker, but Gertrude conjecture says it's certain implies one. So it's all three equivalent. So it doesn't matter what should be the, your uh, criteria. And then there are, um, but this is about uh, actually important thing here is not only one solution should have integer coefficients, but all solutions should have integer coefficients on the basis. And uh, there are some series which are very familiar in mirror symmetry. Uh, you take a number D like Usually five, five. It's for quintic threefold, quintic Calabi-Yau varieties. Some, some whatever. You you take some some like like five n factorial divided by n factorial five. The ratio is integer. It's it's one of solutions of some differential equations, but uh, but it's not algebraic because other solutions are mm, even start with logarithm. It's not even expanded to series. Yeah. So it's one solution is not sufficient. You should look on all of them. And uh, yeah, it was. It looks as a very abstract story, but uh, already in his uh, this paper when he proves the ground technique conjecture in the geometric case, uh, Nick Katz uh, uh, making an application to kind of a really elementary question. It's hypergeometric series. What are hypergeometric series? Yeah, it's uh, uh, maybe I'll just uh, recall you. There are hypergeometric functions of Gauss. It's Consider you got three parameters alpha, beta, gamma, and alpha n is alpha times alpha plus one, etc. Uh, this is a uh, notation. You got this kind of nice uh, uh, ratio of products of some numbers, and it satisfies some nice uh, hypergeometric, uh, it's called hypergeometric differential equations. Uh, it was a very, very popular subject in uh, the 19th century. And uh, one can generalize a little bit instead of product of two numbers, uh, two guys and two guys here, one can make several things here, several here, there. So what is the general hypergeometric equation? You, you take uh, two, uh, you take some integer m, you take m, m rational numbers, alpha one, alpha m, and, and, and another number numbers, beta one, but beta m, and such as they have all different fractional parts. If you remove integer parts, it gets all different numbers. And then you write this differential equations product, which I wrote here, t u d t minus alpha and minus beta times t. And then one can solve it step by step. Uh, you look on uh, uh, how next coefficient determined by previous one, and you write fundamental system solution at zero. It will be kind of generalized uh, hypergeometric series. And if you divide these things by this t to power alpha and by uh, some transcendental constant, you get this, uh, essentially this, uh, this, this uh, thing. So you get some rational number here, rational number here, you get rational numbers, you get series of rational coefficients. And, it's, and you get mm, several such series and they satisfy all the same differential equation which I draw, draw to you. And then, uh, he, he tried to apply this criterion. When this, you get not so many prime numbers in denominators. And the, the answer was the following, uh, that and he got the following theorem, very elementary theorem without using algebraic geometry. If you write this hypergeometric series, it's algebraic if and only if, if for any uh, integer number n, which is co-prime, has no common device as denominators, all this, numbers alpha and betas. When I consider fractional parts of n alphas and n betas, 
the interlacing. What does it mean to interlacing? Maybe I just draw like this. You, uh, you, is this integer parts and alpha i and alpha and beta i belong to it's, it's uh, numbers from zero to one I, and I consider like uh, points on a circle. And I have kind of two class of numbers. Let's one is called like green and another called red. And interlacing means that they go in in such order. Yeah? Something like this. So after uh, red, this will be green, then again red and green. But it will be finite many combinations because you multiply by uh, some number n, they will go in all, all orders, in all, in all these orders should go the same. Yeah, it was a really elementary, uh, nice result. And it comes from analyze how much prime numbers appears in this coefficients on hypergeometric series, and enough to check finitely many. Yeah, so uh, one can classify this algebraic algebraic series in one variable, and one can give a, an answer in terms of fi finite complex reflection group. Yeah, actually, uh, I remember uh, what was my involvement. I, I read maybe in '87 uh, uh, or maybe '86 the paper of Nick Katz. Was very impressed by this result and tried to see. Uh, first, I understand it's because he he wrote just for usual how function is true, but with, obviously it's true for for many. And I tried to prove it, and I proved it in, in elementary way without using algebraic geometry. Then I wrote a paper to him, uh, a letter to him, and he sent me his book. But then, in the meantime, this uh, uh, Franz Berker and uh, uh, Heckman published the paper, so it was kind of discovered at the same time, the same results I never wrote as I think, but I knew this thing from the very beginning. And there are several examples which I kind of worked out at that moment. Uh, there is a kind of the first, the first non-trivial one is the series which I draw here. You take something six and factorial, it's not written as a product of gamma function, but it's very easy to rewrite as a product of gamma function. You take you six n factorial times n factorial, three n factorial, three n factorial, two n factorial, you want to apply this to have singularity at one. Actually, it's very nice here. Number 108, it's six to power six, and one to power one, divided by two. it's kind of general story. And this function is algebraic. Yeah, so it's a rotative formula, which is not obvious at all. And uh, the picture is actually, at the end of the day, it's quite simple. One can form, uh, find all of them and, I remember I was going to some something similar to some kind of like mathematical camp or whatever in a train of uh, whole night. And then uh, this just by pure thinking can found another example. It's also algebraic. Yeah, actually we tried with Don Zagir to write formula for this. It took 20 pages. <laughs> yeah, so it's it's really the, the most uh, one of most monstrous examples. Yeah, yeah, uh, which was not known to earlier. Yeah, actually, there's a uh, little to discuss here. Why this number is integer? It's really it, it's really interesting question. Yeah, uh, and here uh, uh, the only proof which I know is the following: for each prime number, you, you decompose the spouse product of powers of primes. Of course, will be a priori positive or negative exponents. All exponents are non-negative. And how to prove it? Yeah, first of all, we write formal. What is n factorial? It's prime prime decomposition of factorial of any number. It's like this. It's, uh, I'll leave you as easy exercise. Yeah, uh, have numbers divisible by p divided by number divisible by square. Okay, so this is formula. And now, uh, if you want to. Of this crazy product or ratio of product of factorials, to so see what is power of p, you just su substitute this formula, and then you led to this following expression. You get x, which x is n divided by some power of p, and you want to uh, calculate contribution in numerator and denominator. You get this function. This function is periodic with period one, and uh, again I give you as easy exercise to prove this function is always non-negative. In fact, it's always equal to zero or one. 
but yeah, but uh, that's that's depending on the points of view. Yeah, so it's so there's a integer number and. Uh, um, it's a big question. Uh, what is a combinatorial exp explanation? Does it count something? Nobody knows. Yeah, so I asked people in combinatorics for many years. Uh, nobody knows. Then I recently look on, an, uh, there's something called Encyclopedia of Integer Sequences. I found the sequence, and the answer was the following. Kansevich asked the question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, so it's really no explanation, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so just a, 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 a little point that one can prove this algebraicity criterion for hypergeometric series in purely elementary way without using cuts result, which I mentioned, it was, was I discovered when I was a young student, it was simultaneously with Berkers and Heckman. And there's a really simple, uh, very beautiful uh, statement in linear algebra, which should be in textbooks, but it's not. Uh, you consider two unitary matrices of certain size, uh, said that they coincide on the hyperplane. So if we do take uh, on, uh, so the only kind of first or whatever column is, is different. Then uh, you, uh, you associate with this two matrices, uh, two collection of numbers, eigenvalues of first unitary matrix, which are point on a unit circle, again, the second one, and the claims that they're interlacing and conversely for each interlacing collection, you get unique collection pair, pair of unitary matrices. And from this, uh, uh, one can deduce uh, the algebraicity result, uh, kind of without using hard algebraic geometry, but using this basic fact. Okay. Yeah, but uh, in fact, uh, what I said is this theorem of cuts, it's, although the paper was really long, uh, but it was really easy result. And there's really one hard uh, result confirming conjecture. conjectures is a case of. Equations of first order, roughly speaking, when you get uh, uh, scientifically speaking connections of line bundles. And it was proved by Brazos Chudnovsky in 84. I never studied the proof. It's, it's really not my field at all. Uh, but again, one can uh, uh, apply this not P, P curvature, but this weakened form. And it's this really, really elementary statement, uh, which is kind of very deep. Yeah. So that if you have algebraic series in one variable starting from uh, uh, degree one terms with integer coefficients, and suppose you do something crazy, you divide n's coefficient by n, and now take exponent of it, so kind of like go to logarithm and then back to exponent. And suppose this uh, new series also has integer coefficients, th th then it's again algebraic. And the reason, because uh, when you look on this series f and g, you see the uh, uh, this satisfies this differential equation. So if you consider f, it will be f of t will be algebraic function, like coordinates on your curve. Then I get algebraic equation on a curve. So it's a bit more uh, general than I consider on, on a line. And then um, uh, uh, this will be example of this uh, vanishing of p curvature or whatever in gruden d conjecture. And this is the only case when this is proven. Yeah, uh, in fact, uh, uh, this thing, it's, uh, what I explained, it's very recent. It's a, a, a kind of second part of last year. Uh, my French colleagues, Delaguer Rival, proved that, that any algebraic hyperdramatic series of factorial type, like this, this, this guy which I showed to you, if you apply the same game, you get a new algebraic function. Even for this guy, like uh, six n factorial, which is bizarre, you take divide over one over n, you take exponent. You, I, I calculate it on the computer, a few coefficients, you, you see it as the integers. Actually, it's not easy to prove the integers. It's, uh, but it's, it's, not prov it's not easy, but it's not so hard. It's used so-called dwarf criterion when this exponent has integer coefficients. Uh, but you should analyze because we really understand factorials. Uh, periodically, and uh, then one can prove it. And this guy satisfies this algebraic equation, which is a bit more involved, yeah, but, but still manageable. And algebraicity is, again, direct application of the result of Chudnovsky, Chudnovsky. But you see that among all the things, you get really 
there is a really simple class of example which is leads to really beautiful new functions. You take exponent, you take a, b, some integer, and let's say co-prime. And you take sum over one over sum over n greater than one, one over n, and you take binomial coefficient. This is algebraic. Yeah, that's something which people earlier miss. And yeah, for these things, it's kind of easy, easy to understand. But for, for this exponent, it's uh, um, a bit tricky. Yeah. yeah in fact, uh, Don Zager uh, knew it about maybe 10 or 15 years ago, but uh, in, in this specific, specific examples. Yeah. OK, this one application. But now I go to really completely crazy direction. So we change. We go to something very, very different. So what, what I'm doing now, though, it's something called free probability. You, you consider some letters, U1, U2, UK, which are invertible, you can have letters and years. And then you consider monomials, but letters, you cannot, don't allow interchange letters. It's called kind of non-commutative Laurent polynomials. Yeah, so you do something like u1 times u2 times u1 minus 3 times u3 times u. Yeah, you do, you write something like this. And you, you are not allowed to pass one thing through another. Yeah, it's called a uh, fundamental uh, group ring of a free group. Yeah, but it's, uh, and to consider linear combination of such things like, I don't know, 100 to this plus 5 u1 plus 13. You can see the such expressions, yeah? You can add them, multiply, get an algebra. And you get a linear function of this algebra, coefficients of trivial expression, because if you raise these things to power zero, you get one. Now you get some functional tau, and there was a very old theorem, kind of older than me, uh, that, uh, uh, if you get any element of this algebra and you make generating series of this constant terms of n powers, you get some series, and you get algebraic function. Yeah, this is a color of, uh, it's a very, very old result uh, and uh, almost forgotten. And this is a color of series of algebraic series in free variables. There is some notion of algebraic function of non-commuting variables. Uh, what are definitions? Yeah, first one, one uh, uh, start with rational functions in non-commuting variables. Uh, this, uh, this double brackets means it's kind of consider all possible expressions without inverting things, uh, formal linear combination. And the expression is rational if you can calculate it using like finite automata or, uh, or um, one of the definitions of following: you get certain suppose you get certain matrices, actual numbers as coefficients, and multiply t zero by this inverse guy. You expand the geometric progression, and then you get your series. Okay, uh, if if variables will commute, it will be usual uh, rational functions. Uh, also, I can say what's a series algebraic. Uh, it means that, uh, in fact, there are many. Uh, so, suppose you get one series starting with one. Suppose you get several series starting with one, containing uh, this one is one as element, and this satisfies some system equations. Each of them is one plus some expression in x and f, which contains at least one x. And then you can iterate it and you calculate step by step next term and uh, kind of a unique fixed point. And uh, uh, so the system has unique solution by iteration, and we call such series algebraic. Yeah, that looks a kind of nice world. We have, uh, instead of commuting variables, free variables, we have rational functions, algebraic functions. But what's a algebraic function? It's really a very dangerous notion because you can write system equations. Solution looks like equal to one, but we can, we'll be never able to prove it because it's one can make universal Turing machine, so it's, it's algorithmically unsolvable. 
So it's uh, kind of dangerous to work with a uh, ring. And the result by Schutzenberger is that uh, uh, something which is not, not wrong in commutative setting, you have non-commutative series and rational series in many variables. And that to do something is called Adamar product. You multiply coefficients by coefficient. Then you get again algebraic series. Yeah, so uh, so each series is infinite sum of inverse in your generators. Uh, and you take a uh, uh, product of coefficients of the same word, multiply every word, and after this convolution, you get algebraic series. And how uh, oh, oh, this result by Chomsky Schutzberger Berger goes? Mm. You do the following. When you write elements in this uh, in this start to invert variable, you start to treat inverse variables as like kind of dual variable in uh, variable star. Yeah, uh, you forget that x times x inverse is equal to one. Where it things, but now you want to make cancellation, and this cancellation uh, is uh, is an uh, algebraic series. One can. Uh, you can consider a collection of words in X and X star, so that they cancel when I roll the little X star this X star inverse. Uh, that satisfies some non system of algebraic equations, and, uh, and, uh, and then um, from this whole result follows. Okay, but then uh, about more than 10 years ago, there was a a paper in archive uh, by uh, some friend of mine, he uh, rediscovered the result of Shotsky because it was very well for forgotten. He kind of rediscovered it. But somehow, uh, 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 and I look on it and realize that they knew something about grotten dick conjecture and this Chernovsky Chernovsky result, and that they fit together very nicely. And I proved the following theory, which I never published. It was it was an archive. Uh, it was uh, some kind of my short talk on Arbeit Stagung. Uh, uh, that uh, if you get, instead of genetic series, you can see the element of this ring, you can see the uh, raised to n's power, get sequence of numbers. Now take divide them by n, take genetic series, and take exponents. It's again algebraic. Uh, yeah. Why it's true? Yeah. One can assume that uh, shows that this expression has integer coefficients. Uh, if it's not integer, there's, there's some little game how we go from one to another, but uh, that's a central case. And if it's integer coefficients, I want to prove that exponents also has integer coefficients. And then I can apply this uh, Chernovsky Chernovsky result because it's uh, derivative of logarithm will be algebraic series, and this is integer, so it's also again algebraic. And why it's integer coefficients? It's very easy. It's, it's, if you write, it's kind of element of this sum of monomials, uh, not monomials, it's kind of the community of Laurent monomials, element of the group, and take this exponent. It's very easy to analyze when you get consolation, you get some infinite product, a product over sequences of elements whose product is equal to one, and they're not cyclically repeating. And if you obviously get integer things. <laughs> it's a very cheap result. It's, um, so not like for hyperdramatic functions, we had to work hard to prove integrality. It's, it's really nothing. And if you use it in free group, no, there's no element of finite order. That's it. Yeah, so it was kind of uh, strange theorem. It's kind of at most, dis, uh, from my point, it's, at least for me, it's most dishonest result because at that time, I use, uh, I heard something about this uh, uh, Schutzenberger result. I heard something about Chernovsky, Chernovsky. I never studied them. It's not my piece of cake. But I see that they kind of fits together, like they created for each other. And up to now, people in combinatorics completely puzzled how to understand that the algebraic function. What is the degree of algebraic function? No, nobody has any idea. Yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of mysterious proof, very mysterious proof. And uh, uh, at that time, uh, uh, why consider this series? What, what was for me the meaning of this? I put minus signs because one over algebraic functions algebraic. Uh, why, why, is it, uh, why should I consider such a guy? This thing tau, this functional, has a property this tau of AB is equal to tau of BA. It's very easy to, to, to see. Okay, and let's remind what is it? Like for matrices, if you have trace of 
matrix AB is equal to trace of matrix BA. So it's like trace. And if it will be, instead of this huge algebra, it will be algebra of matrices, then the six is equal to get determinant. You get characteristic polynomial. So for me, it was kind of like not, uh, strange non commutative characteristic polynomial. Yeah, but uh, okay. So, uh, one can make some little calculation. Yeah, for example, take this uh, genesis UI, take into get kind of random work on a free group, what's called. You consider UI and your inverse and take the sum. You can calculate the things that people knew it for, uh, for 100 years, this genetic series. And exponent is also some nice things, which is uh, a bit more involved, but uh, another algebraic function. Yeah, again, a little question for specialists. What is going on? I really don't understand. Um, my guess is the following. You, you have this element, for example, like this guy. Uh, remove some constant, some complex number, and take, take inverse, two-sided inverse of them. You get some big algebra. And this big algebra has something like periodic cyclic drum homology called periodic cyclic homology. And maybe for the special values, when you get radius of convergence of this guy, two to square to, to square root one, something will happen with this thing. It will change size. And uh, outside, it will be maybe well, finite dimensional and get finite one drum. Maybe this is explanation of algebraicity. But it's a uh, kind of uh, very wild guess. Yeah. Yeah, but what, what uh, I said it's analog of the trace, but uh, in what sense? And uh, is this something you really realized maybe in last November, December, beginning of December? And um, I heard some talk on run probability and realized it's, it's actually a very, very natural thing. It was a serum proven by uh, uh, Dan Wikulescu and maybe early 80s. Yeah, he started a subject called free probability. And it's the following. Suppose have you have said the unitary matrices of very large size, orthogonal matrices, it gives the same answer. You get a space of unitary matrices is a big, a compact Lie group. It has natural Haar measure, natural in, uh, um, probability measure, uh, kind of uh, uh, uniform measure, it's like, well, not defined notion of random unitary matrix. Matrix. Then you take write any expressions like like this guy, any u, u inverse, u two, blah blah blah. Take a trace of this guy. You get some random number, divide by size of a matrix, and see what will be average value of this guy. If the expression is one, the trace of identity matrix is the size of matrix divided by get one. If it's not one, then the kind of behave randomly. It should go to zero. It's it's not, it's not really difficult result. Yeah, now and, and now uh, if I look on this, then can realize what is the meaning of this genetic series which you're considering. Uh, you can see this algebra of expressions in the UIs, and it's something called star algebra. You can uh, like imagine the UI unitary operator, so it's the Hermitian joint is inverse. And now consider any self adjoint element. If you apply uh, to a unitary matrix, you get self adjoint operator. And the claim from this picture is that uh, from this limit theorem is that. If you get this random element, you can see the matrix of very, very large size. Uh, uh, then uh, uh, there will be some uh, there will be something remarkable. Lines. There will be some probability measure on on real line, whose moments integrals of x to power n will be tau of a to power n. Yeah. So why why this appears? Uh, because if you have a uh, uh, Hermitian matrix, it has some eigenvalues. And eigenvalues are some n numbers, lambda one, lambda two, lambda n. And you consider kind of sum of delta function, whatever it means, divided by n. You get probability measure is kind of like, uh, if you integrate from zero to infinity, you get some growing function like, like this kind from zero. To, how many eigenvalues, uh, proportion of eigenvalues less than given number. And derivatives will be probability measure. and uh, uh, this, uh, the story is a phonic. It's You get random probability measure uh, for given size and tau to power n will, will be, uh, uh, for large n will be essentially the moment of this guy. And then uh, it's easy to see that things will be not 
random at infinity, and you get absolutely canonical probability measures. So how again values for this very huge matrix are distributed? Yeah, so to get result, so now we go to a little bit to probability theory, and oops, okay, okay, yeah, uh, uh, and then what does this algebraic uh, brace result say tells you? For these expressions which are self-adjoint, first things we consider is integrals of one minus dx, a generic series of moments, it's algebraic, and more kind of complicated result using this uh, dark art from uh, Grotendieck conjecture, says it's exponent source algebraic. But uh, uh, even for first things, I want to see the kind of corollary. The corollary is that the density of this probability distribution is again algebraic function. Yeah, that's a bit a little story which I don't want to tell you. That's uh, it's come again with uh, it took several years and some a bit of confusions. But uh, but at the end of the day, it turns out that uh, it's it's follows from the first first statement. If you get probability measure, it makes this integral. You get analytic function on the complement. The integral will be convergent. Yeah. So if you get let's say real line, uh, you get real line inside the complex line and get some kind of probability measure. Now you, you start to integrate one over x minus one of this measure. And the integral, this will be very well defined outside. You get holomorphic function outside. And then you have jump. You go from this branch to this branch. And this jump will be value of your density. So of course, if, if it's function is algebraic, the jump is also algebraic. And then for example, for this, uh, some of your eyes, you can calculate the density, you get, get some, and there's some algebraic function. So again, solution of some quadratic equation. Okay, yeah, at the moment I can forget about this exponent. Then uh, uh, this uh, random unitary matrices is uh, some nice object, but there's even nice object called Gaussian unitary ensemble. Uh, you can see the matrices of huge size n by n, and each, uh, now each entry will be random Gaussian variable. Random Gaussian matri variable and you normalize in a certain uh, way depending on uh, an N. And um, then it has kind of very nice limit behavior when size matrices goes to infinity. And now if you calculate with this random Gaussian ensemble, it's a different rules. Now we have matrices which are Hermitian matrices, you don't allow to invert them. So you have uh, considered Hermitian conjugate to get the same guy. And now I have a functional, uh, uh, like you have several independent Gaussian matrices and the trace of their product and goes to some combinatorial uh, game the following. If you have a word in, in this generators, then I associate some integer number, uh, like how many times you can uh, decompose into pairs so that pairs do not interlace. Uh, yeah, so before they were interlacing for those ones, and now it should not, not crossing partition, but pairings is called, yeah. And uh, and similar to the same story for unitary matrices, one get the same thing for limiting distribution of Hermitian matrices and moments gets kind of the same um, picture. For any self-adjoint element expression in, in pairs of matrices, you get limiting distribution of eigenvalues. And this moment, but it does by pure pure thought. And as uh, now I learned, I learned a little bit the subject, this is formal languages, and I can prove very easily now theorem, some theorems that if I make generic series of moments, this will get algebraic guy, but not this exponential things which is uh, more involved. But already this first one is already interesting, and the fact is the following. Uh, uh, you consider all possible words and, and letters and take infinite sum of them and each of them uh, count with the weight number of this non-crossing pairing. You get some huge sum, which is, maybe I can write how it looks like. You get some one plus x1, x1. Okay. You get maybe something like x1, x1, x2. Yeah, you write some of all possible paired, paired uh, 
in indices uh, of all those things. You get this, you write this huge infinite expression, and the claim satisfies quadratic equation. It's, uh, yeah, it satisfies quadratic equation. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. A claim that P is equal to one plus what? Uh, yeah, first, first uh, if you get such thing, you get maybe a trivial word one. If it's some trivial, start with some letter. Let's say X1. But this letter X1 is paired with another X1. And what is the between should be P. Again, okay. outside should be P. Or maybe the first letter is two, P2, X2. Yeah, so you see that it satisfies this quadratic equation in, no, in non commutative uh, uh, variables, whatever it means. Yeah, and then you can substitute it to itself, and as a solution, a uh, fixed point gives you this series. And then you can apply the same gain and uh, using this result of schutzen bijet proof algebraicity. And color is that the density is piecewise algebraic function. Yeah, actually, now we go to really kind of Basic questions. So we got this nice distribution of eigenvalues for so some expressions. Let's let's do case of one matrix, one Hermitian matrix with random uni, random Gaussian uh, entries. Uh, then this generic series for this moment satisfies this quadratic equation. And then this, so the quadratic equations one can call it jump and get the following density of distributions. Get some square root of whatever four minus x square, maybe divided by o pi. You get semicircle. It's a very famous result in um, a random matrix, kind of first result called Wigner semicircle law. If you take huge matrices with random coefficients, that eigenvalues are distributed with such densities. It will be more in the middle and uh, goes to the end. But now I can do a little bit more. I take like two matrices, x1, x2. Take the x1, x2 plus x2, x1. So the guys should be again Hermitian. And then I run through the machinery, calculate the genetic series for this uh, momenta, get a solution of a bit more complicated uh, algebraic equation. And then you get things supported on intervals of very, very strange lengths 11 plus <laughs> whatever things. And the solution satisfies this. Uh, Whatever uh, this uh, square satisfies the six order equation. Yeah, it's kind of it's a really new result. I, I, somehow people miss it. It was uh, it, it all, all the machinery was developed, but somehow nobody made a calculation, uh, even this very simple very simple case. Yeah, so I get this uh, algebraic density. And now I can I even try to make this computer experiment. I just uh, I have this uh, algebraic function uh, uh, sitting on this interval. I draw this graph of this function. And now I took two matrices of big size and uh, does uh, uh, randomly choose the coefficients, make symmetric, the anti commutator, calculate, you see kind of the same curve. So it's really didn't make many, any mistake here. So it's really. On, on, can really make experiments uh, kind of uh, with, this, uh, with this things, not like his usual matrix models. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so what happens? Again, let's recapitulate. Uh, we have, let's say, unitary matrices, or maybe this uh, Gaussian ensemble, and we get plenty of algebraic, see, algebraic functions. We have density of eigenvalues. We get this what's called Cauchy steel test trans transform of this. Uh, and on the unitary case, we get even more complicated things by this Chudnovsky uh, uh, Chudnovsky result, which is for which we have really no exp explanation up to now. Yeah, so there are three things. And what, uh, what is this, uh, what are the slogan doing here? Mm. Yeah, so uh, I ask myself, what does this think? Is it really something normal to, in the subject to write? It turns out, yes. But uh, for, uh, for what purposes? Uh, uh, for this 
kind of Gaussian uh, run uh, Gaussian ensemble, there's a generalization. You can see the arbitrary polynomial of matrix, something like exponent minus n times trace of x4 times plus x squared, something like this. You can see the such expression. Uh, it will be density on distribution of some Hermitian, one Hermitian matrix of very large size. You normalize to get probability measure. And then uh, this is a huge subject. Oops. Okay. Uh, this, is, this is a huge subject in uh, uh, modern mathematical physics and string theory, even. Uh, it's called matrix models. You start, want to study this behavior of such thing for large matrices. And then, um, it turns out that uh, if you consider uh, limiting density of eigenvalues, it's the kind of really first works by Brizana, and Sixon, and Zuber, uh, 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 kind of very rough probability theory tells you the following. Uh, uh, this density is the solution of some minimize, some kind of maximize probability in certain sense. So this will come from exponential terms. It's come from uh some uh, 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 some determinant in, in uh, you're gonna go to eigenvalues it's a technical story you get some uh, this expression and you write uh, critical points solve early Lagrange equation you essentially get some unknown constant and uh, uh, so you see the density it's integral with respect to this logarithm kernel so it's really nature appears in uh, when I interpret it's one matrix model, one matrix Hermitian model. And um, then one can make little calculations. Yeah, for example, in uh, for random uh, Gaussian ensemble, you get x square, and the integral is really equal to you integrate its density, square root of square root, with logarithm, you get x square root of two, model constant as it should be. But now I can try to do six, which comes not from Hermitian matrices. You get unitary matrices. Uh, this simple calculation I've done before. We we'll do these things. You get some density. It's, it's all fine. But when you have just one unitary matrix at the inverse, this integral gets zero. What is what is going on? It's 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 kind of elementary identity, but it's really very funny. It means that if you consider Random unitary matrix and at inverse, it has the same distribution in values as random Hermitian matrix, matrix. You're going to get potential zero, but but things should be supported some interval. You say that all eigenvalues between minus two and two. You consider some strange open domain in space of Hermitian matrices. You put conditions all eigenvalues between minus two and two, and then the distribution is the same for the sum. I really have no idea why it's, why it's going on, but it's color of this. Uh, calculation and now this algebraicity which we deduce using this um, remarkable result by Chernovsky Chernovsky of exponent was it was it what does it mean if you uh, uh, look on this formal back and forth it says that if you have this expression in unitary matrices like u plus u inverse plus u2 plus u inverse so long it looks like Hermitian matrix model when you get non-polynomial potential, people usually consider polynomial potential, but here will be logarithm of algebraic function. You know, something kind of lesson to for, for physicists that potential should be logarithm of algebraic function, not polynomial, uh, to fit the whole things together. And yeah, and if you look, uh, 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 <laughs> kind of make this picture, kind of smiling picture, yeah, <laughs> yeah, so that you get algebraicity of various uh, gadgets. There's some easy things going to take derivative still Perron, but then the Grotten D conjecture goes one way and also potential Hermitian matrix. Yeah, so it's kind of really strange mixture of this argument from number theory and random matrices making this strange mess. Thank you. Questions, uh, right? Any questions? Yes. Okay. So in the original uh, for any type of theology differential equation and those from geometric or from the commutative type of the 
Yeah, yeah it's disappeared here yeah, completely. Yeah. 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 Any more questions? Everybody's happy. Okay, yeah. Oh, there's a question, yeah? There's a question, yeah. Oh, yeah, it's a problem, please. That's also when you kill a people who are only distributing more structure. Sorry? So you, you want to you kill two distributing, one is the summit for law, and the second one will be that uh, people need to leave the law on time, but. Uh, yeah, uh, oh. I, I, mean, I mean, is this. Uh, is this yeah, it? This one. So yeah. What, what is this? So I also miss this. this yeah, no, you can see two, two, two huge matrices, yeah. thousand by thousand. Two coefficients at random to make it yeah. symmetric. Yeah, consider eigenvalues x one of this this expression x one x two plus x one, and make a histogram. So it will be uh, uh, this. This will be how many eigenvalues in this? Yeah, uh, I think, I think, but, uh, this no, no, no. Yeah, it's no. There are infinitely many. Uh, all of them are. Yeah. Okay. Because, because the first one is semicircular. Is it's semicircular, yeah, and and even kind of this, the first non first non trivial expression you can do like this. Uh, I think of what we Kolesko calculated maybe some of x one plus x two, <laughs> but not not this expression. Yeah, so it's, he, he made this. Yeah. More question. Okay. Oh, yes, it's one question. Yes, uh, let me give you this. Uh, the, how is key conversion related to that? Uh, the notion of coaching is very much Ah, yeah, I, I can. Uh, the story is the following if you have a bundle with connection, a vector bundle with connection in. First, uh, this notion of curvature. When you have two vector fields, you take commutator of two vector fields to get uh, a leaf goes to the commutator. Uh, the vanishing of curvature is uh, related to the following thing. You have two vector fields. Uh, then, then you leave them to some operators in, in your bundle, and you want to show that Uh, this map, uh, uh, you check whether this map preserves or doesn't preserve the commutator, you, the, this, this usual curvature. But in characteristic P, if C is a vector field, and C to power P is again a vector field. Yeah, and now you check whether this operation is also compatible with the lift and the failure uh, controlled by this called P curvature. Hey, yes. Oh, is this another? I'm sure it's about the relation between this uh, absolute garbage and power and the linear field power. So that means you have a solution and the integral uh, owner. You may have the equal point and the equal point. Yeah. And also the jump, which is something like a dot. Yeah. Uh, no differential equations are lost. No, I think it's uh, yeah, the, yeah, this yeah, no, for differential equation, I ask the question about periodic cyclic homology. That's that's potentially the way to see this differential equations, which yeah, it's not clear where they, they come from. Yeah. yeah. Any more questions? Well, okay, one week. Sorry, this is a really basic question. Do you, do you have a sense of like why the non commutativity is important? Is it for commutatory reasons? Uh, no, uh, the obvious reasons it gives you answer for the. Uh, 
It's a question for big matrices. I don't know. It's... Yeah, I was about asking, like, can we really do this calculation? I mean, is there some sort of Model. Yes, yes, yeah, no, exactly, yeah, you consider big random uh, uh, with unitary distribution Hermitian matrices, it's, it's, yeah, one can do really kind of Monte Carlo experiments here. Yeah, no, I mean, like, if you're, if you're Sorry? Yeah. No, no, it's limit of commutative calculation in very high dimensions, yeah, that's, yeah. that's it. Wow. Yeah. Like your thing, I'll speak again. Okay. 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 Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is this time in Chomsky? Uh, Noam Chomsky. It's it's 